Good afternoon, everyone. This workshop will explore what's involved in starting a Sea Scout ship by an auxiliary flotilla or division. I'm assuming that you're attending this workshop because you've either decided that you want to do this or that you're seriously considering it and want to know whether it's really something that you feel comfortable trying to do. Let me begin by saying that if you want to work with Sea Scouts in your capacity as an auxiliarist, starting a Sea Scout ship is not the only way you can help. I'm going to very briefly explain what Sea Scouting is and uh, what uh, some of the other options are for working with the Sea Scouts. Sea Scouting is a program of the Boy Scouts of America for young men and women ages 14 to 20. Sea Scouts have been a part of BSA since 1912. For the youth, Sea Scouts offer high adventure in, on, around, and under the water. For adults, Sea Scouts gives us a way to pre prepare young people to make ethical choices over their lifetimes by instilling in them the values of the Scout Oath and Law. The reason why the auxiliary cares about this is that since 2018, Sea Scouting has been our official youth program. Sea Scouting has a number of objectives, which include promoting better citizenship, improving boating skills and knowledge in water safety, providing outdoor social and service experiences to young adults, giving young adults the opportunity to gain knowledge of their our maritime heritage, and of course, having fun on the water. There are a lot of similarities between Sea Scouting and other scout programs. Sea Scouts, though, are older and more mature, which makes them very different from Cubs and Scouts BSA. Teenage young adults and boats means much more advanced outdoor programs. I'm assuming that you understand why it's important for the auxiliary to be working with Sea Scouts. If not, there's a video on the subject on the Aux Scout YouTube channel. Its title is Working with Sea Scouts for the Future of the Coast Guard Auxiliary. What we want to explore now is how we as auxiliaries can help the Sea Scouts. I'm going to begin by spending a few moments talking about ways to get involved that don't involve starting a Sea Scout unit. There are hundreds of Sea Scout ships all over the country, and many would welcome the opportunity to work with you. This can be as informal as occasional visits to teach special subjects like navigation or radio communication, or a more formal commitment to provide auxiliaries as adult leaders and trainers and setting up underway training opportunities on Sea Scout and auxiliary vessels. We'll follow this presentation on starting a ship with a separate talk on partnering with Sea Scouts. You're probably wondering where the Sea Scout ships are, right? This, is a, this ha, has a quick and easy answer. If you go to tinyurl.com slash map, you'll find a United States map that shows where all of the Sea Scout ships and Coast Guard Auxiliary flotillas are. Each dot includes a very brief contact information along with information about the local Scout Council. What you'll discover is that in some areas, there are lots of Sea Scout ships, and it'll just be a matter of linking up with a unit that's already there. In other areas, the closest Sea Scout ship may be dozens of miles away, and the best plan may be to start one where you are. So if there's a ship in your area, reach out to them and ask if they could use your help. If there isn't a ship, why don't you think about starting your own? Remember that we're not only allowed, but we're encouraged by the Coast Guard to consider starting Sea Scout ships and making them a part of our recreational boating safety program. Let's look at what's involved in doing that. 
According to past National Commodore Rick Washburn, quote, with this cooperative effort, we'll reach out to the emerging population of young adults who share the auxiliary's commitment to safe boating, service to the nation, and the Coast Guard and maritime careers, end of quote. The best way to build a recreational boating safety program for youth in your area is to organize a Sea Scout ship. A ship, the local Sea Scout unit, involves making an agreement between the charter organization and the local BSA council. In it, the charter organization agrees to follow BSA organization and program standards, approve adult leadership, and provide or arrange for a meeting place. The ship isn't a legal entity, but the charter organization must be enough of one to be able to enter into an agreement. As of today, there are 26 auxiliary flotillas and divisions that charter Sea Scout ships. I'd like to point out that you will be requesting two charters, one from the Boy Scouts of America, which is what we're looking at on the screen, as well as one from the Coast Guard. We're going to initially focus on the BSA charter process and then move on to the Coast Guard charter. Is it going to rain? Uh, would you please turn off your microphone? Here are the major components of a Sea Scout ship. In BSA speak, the chartered organization is another name for the sponsor. If your flotilla or division charters a ship, then it will, will be a chartered organization. The ship committee is a group of adults who provide resources to make the unit happen. They don't necessarily work within work directly with the Sea Scout youth, although they may. The skipper and mates are adults who do work directly with the youth and supervise meetings and outings. They also teach and guide the youth leadership. The bosun and youth officers are the elected youth members who provide leadership to ship meetings, outings, and projects. The youth are the rest of the Sea Scouts in the ship. And finally, consultants are adults who provide expertise or advice, but who aren't necessarily BSA registered adult leaders. Let's take a moment to talk about the relationship between the flotilla or division and the Sea Scout ship. Before I go any further, I should point out that ships can be chartered, in, uh, chartered to either flotillas or divisions. Throughout this talk, I'll talk about flotillas being the chartered organization, but remember that divisions can fill that role as well. In many cases, although the chartered organization supports the ship, it's pretty hands off in the way they interact with the unit. In this case, the flotilla serves as the chartered organization, but the ship operates mostly independently of the flotilla. The ship plans its, its on, own on the water activities and meetings without necessarily coordinating with the flotilla. Joint activities such as PA booths may happen. There might be, they, there might be only a few or there be, could be quite a few such activities. While some of the adult leadership will come from the flotilla, many of the adult leaders could come from parents or from other sources. The program of the ship doesn't necessarily overlap with what the flotilla is working on, and the ship will definitely want to rely on flo the flotilla to provide some of its training program and social activities. Depending on the needs of the flotilla and the ship, the two groups may decide that they want to work very closely together on training, on the water activities, shoreside projects and public affairs activities. In this case, most of the ship's adult leadership may come from the flotilla and much or most of the ship's underway opportunities may occur, occur aboard auxiliary opfacts. So what's involved in getting a ship started? What we're going to do now is walk you through the process of organizing a Sea Scout ship. 
broadly, it involves holding a meeting at which you decide what you want, that you want to organize the ship and determine who's going to do what. Then you need to identify the adult leadership, recruit some youth members, and finally address BSAs and the Coast Guard's paperwork requirements. Simple, right? Let's start with one of the most important early steps you need to take. Do a program capability inventory. What this does is helps you to identify who is going to help, what, uh, who has access to what equipment, what skills they have, and other resources that are available in-house. If you're thorough in your assessment, you'll probably find that you have more resources than you initially thought you had. There may be some gaps though, and taking the time early on to identify what those gaps are and how you're gonna fill them will be an important contribution to the overall success of the effort. One more thing, don't focus on obtaining boats. In my experience, there are lots of people who are willing to make their boats available to help young people learn how to boat safely. Borrowing boats is much simpler and much cheaper than taking on a project boat that will take a lot of effort to make seaworthy. No teenager wants to spend most of their free time sanding a boat bottom. Finding adult leaders can be as tough as finding youth to start the ship. Identifying the right person to be the skipper is very important. So take your time with this recruiting uh, effort. The skipper is the key adult leader who will be working with the youth. He or she will need to have a couple of assistants who are called mates. Being a skipper is a big job. This shouldn't be someone with other extensive flotilla responsibilities, such as the flotilla commander. Identify other members of the ship committee. They'll help behind the scenes with management tasks like advancement, fundraising, publicity, finance, and related tasks. Remember that you don't have to limit yourselves to flotilla members. Additional help can come from other uh, scout groups, parents, boating groups, and networking. So where do the youth come from? You, and by you, I mean the flotilla and uh, ship leadership, have to find them and sell them on the idea of joining you. There's no magic list of kids who are just waiting to join the Sea Scouts. Potential members can come from other scouting units, schools, churches, yacht clubs, junior civic organizations, neighbors, or scouting youth siblings. Local councils should have a list of scouts who have dropped out and the reasons for leaving scouting. The council scouting professional, professional should be able to provide you with a list and contact information. As you're planning your ship's program, there are some things to consider. Ideally, the youth you recruit should plan and lead all activities. That said, they may be reluctant to take on this responsibility on day one. In new ships, the adults will need to coach them on program planning and running activities. They'll, uh, they'll catch on pretty quickly, but don't assume that they'll just figure it out on their own. Your meetings need to be held regularly in a predictable location. Most ships meet either weekly or biweekly. Some meet even more frequently. Try to find a location where they can really focus on what they're doing without too many distractions. Also, consider whether the location is somewhere where teenagers will be comfortable. Meetings should focus on training and activity planning and should not be focused on business and lectures. Teenagers who spend all day in class will be quickly bored with business and lectures. They're looking to see scouts so that they can do something that is different and fun. Depending on where you're located, the local Sea Scout organization may have resources that will help get you started. 
This may include vessels, instructors, and coaches. Reach out to them to see what they can provide. Please note, though, that this is far from universal. Some Sea Scout, although Sea Scouting is very strong in some areas, it may be totally absent in others. If you're taking the initiative to start a ship, you should contact the Sea Scout Council Commodore or the Council's Commissioner staff. Some councils may have a professional on staff who is assigned to work with Sea Scouts. Some councils may have a new unit commissioner whose job is to help new units through the initial registration process and during the first three to six months of operation. If you're unsure who to talk to, contact your SOAS or DSOAS to help identify who your scout contact should be. That person will review with you what is involved in organizing and chartering a new Sea Scout ship and walk you through the BSA paperwork process. Please note, though, that they will be focusing on the BSA paperwork. You'll need to involve your SOAS or DSOAS to help you with the Coast Guard paperwork. I want to spend a moment to mention that the Scout Council, what the Council will and won't do for you. They will provide help with recruiting materials and training resources. They'll also tell you about local resources to support your, support your Sea Scout ship. If they don't bring it up, ask them about it. On the other hand, don't expect them to recruit youth or adult leaders for you. They won't find a meeting place for you and they'll be able to obtain equipment for you. That said, the council through the district executive should be able to provide you with a list of drops from Scouts BSA troops and their reasons for dropping. If your council has a Sea Scout committee or council commodore, they may be able to help you with some of these needs. Don't count on it though. Now let's have a look at what training is available from BSA and the auxiliary. The scouts have a broad range of training available. A great place to start is to go to the Sea Scout leader training page on the Sea Scouts BSA website. Several courses are described and linked to there. Some of these courses are available online. In addition to youth protection training, which we'll talk more about in a minute, you should plan on taking the Sea Scout Adult Leader Basic Training early on. There are several 15 to 60 minute workshops recorded on the Sea Scout uh, YouTube channel. The workshops focus on practical best practice techniques on topics that will interest auxiliarists working with Sea Scouts. There are also many scout activity safety courses online. Depending on how you'll be working with the scouts, you may need to take the safety afloat and the safe swim defense training. Each is very straightforward and takes less than an hour to complete. The weekend Sea Badge Conference is held regionally and focuses on strategies for teaching and managing youth-led Sea Scout program. Some Sea Badge conferences will be held over the next couple of years that are specifically focused on auxiliary trainees. They're fun and very informative. I'd like to quote a Sea Scout skipper who joined our flotilla here in Maryland. He reminds everyone that every scout deserves a trained leader. I'd like to take a few moments to focus on BSA's youth protection training which is also referred to as YPT. YPT covers a set of practices that are designed to both protect young people from any possibility of abuse, but also to make sure adults don't put themselves into situations where they could be accused of abusing. The key principles are there should never be any one-on-one -on -one contact with youth, and there should be too deep leadership on all activities. Youth protection training can be taken online. It takes about an hour and a half to complete. 
All auxiliarists working with Sea Scouts are required to complete this training in flotillas or divisions that are chartered by sea, uh, chartering Sea Scout ships. This includes the commander, vice commander, and the staff officers for Aux Scout, human resources, member training, and operations. They should send their YPT completion certificates in to Diarox and have it entered into their AUX data record. Several workshops have been developed that can be delivered live at district or sector training conferences. The National Youth Programs Division can provide trainers who can mentor local members. Online workshops on a variety of topics are available and most have been recorded. Live workshops are announced ahead of time over Facebook. Recordings are available on the Ox Scout YouTube channel. Additionally, the youth program staff are available for coaching on special topics. Contact us and we'll match you up with the best person for your need. Okay, so you've recruited your adult leadership and your initial group of Sea Scouts. You have a meeting place and a plan for the initial three months of program and you're ready for the paperwork fund. Let's talk about that now. Your BSA charter application consists of a completed BSA new unit application. This includes the FC's signature. BSA adult applications and youth applications for each ship member, proof of youth protection training for all adults, a charter fee and insurance, and this fee varies from council to council, and a registration fee for each individual. Uh, this will then be turned in to the local scout council for processing. Once you've received confirmation from the local scout council that your charter application will be accepted and that the BSA charter paperwork is complete, you'll need to request a Coast Guard charter. Your flotilla commander must request a Coast Guard charter through the chain of leadership and management. This request will go through the division commander who will then forward it for review to the district commodore who in turn will forward it with endorsement to DIROX. Once DIROX receives the request, an auxiliary charter will be issued to the flotilla. If YPT completion for any of the flotilla members who are required to have completed it is not already in AUX data, then send copies of the YPT completion certificates along with the charter request. This process can be done entirely via email. A suggested format for a flotilla or division requesting permission to charter a Sea Scout ship is available on the chartering a Sea Scout ship AUXB wiki page. So the approval sequence of events is BSA approval from the local scout council, then DIROX approval through the chain of leadership and management. When both have approved, then you can commence activity. A boating safety class is a great way to start and it's an and an advancement requirement for the Sea Scouts. Make training as hands-on as you can. The youth who join Sea Scouts are motivated. Many are taking advanced and AP uh, high school classes and are involved in high school extracurricular programs such as sports, band, orchestra, theater, chorus, and robotics. They do not want to follow their a packed school schedule with more lectures at Scouts. Make sure to balance training with fun activities to keep the youth engaged. I'd like to take a moment to talk about available web resources. There are two main social media groups and two websites. The Ox Scout Facebook group is very active and involves both auxiliary and Sea Scout participation. It focuses on best practices for how the Sea Scouts and Auxiliary work together. Messages are screened before they're posted, so you'll only see messages that are on topic. There's also an Ox Scout YouTube channel that, uh, with dozens of terrific training, 
program and public affairs videos. Subscribe to the channel and ring the bell so that you will be notified when new content is posted. Beyond these social media groups, please take the time to become very familiar with Oxby Wiki and the Sea Scouts BSA website. Oxby Wiki provides a vast amount of information on how to work with the Sea Scouts and what the Coast Guard's official policy is when working with the Scouts. The Sea Scouts BSA website, needless to say, focuses on what Sea Scouting is and provides resources for implementing the program. Both the Auxiliaries Youth Programs Division and the Sea Scouts provide targeted information on starting ships. Oxby Wiki has a Chartering a Sea Scout Ship page, and the Sea Scouts BSA website has a New Ships Organization Kit. Additionally, Bart Knapp of the Auxiliary Youth Programs Division is an expert on working through the process. Bart's email address is on the page here. Incidentally, this is what a Coast Guard ship charter looks like. So uh, at this point, what I hope you'll do is um, uh, keep in mind what your questions are. And if you want to put them in chat, please do so. The uh, web address for all of the links in this preceding uh, presentation are at this URL. And Holly will be posting that in chat. So I would recommend that you either copy that down or click on it. And what I'm going to do now um, is move into the partnership presentation. And we'll have some time after that to take your questions. So just a moment while I get up the other presentation. So here we go. Hello. Thank you for taking the time to join me today in this workshop on developing partnerships with Sea Scout ships. My name is Derek Cogburn, and I am delighted and honored to serve as the skipper of Sea Scout Ship 1959, Seafarer's Commitment, based in Annapolis, Maryland. Our ship was honored. Oh, crap. to be named the 2021 National Flagship. And I'm excited to share with you a few ideas that we have about partnerships and the role and impact that it's had on our ship. So first off, what are some of our goals? So in this workshop, I would like to help auxiliaries and other Sea Scout leaders understand what are some of the opportunities as well as some of the challenges for building partnerships that support Sea Scout ships. I want to highlight how partnerships between ships and flotillas can be particularly helpful and mutually beneficial. We feel that our ship represents a good model uh, of ship flotilla partnerships, and we know that some flotillas may want to consider chartering their own ships, while others may want to understand how to provide occasional uh, help, kind of the, the spectrum of ship flotilla partnerships. We also believe that we have identified some best practices that have worked for us, but we also want to have um, share with you some of our uh, lessons learned that we've experienced as well. So let's talk a little bit about our founding partnerships, as well as some of our initial partnerships that came right after the ship was founded. So as we were laying the groundwork to found our ship, um, we founded the ship with several formal partnerships, and all of those had to have board uh, approval. So the first was that our chartered organization is the Seafarers Foundation. So the Seafarers Foundation is a 501c3 Maryland, uh, registered Maryland charity, and it serves as the philanthropic arm of the Seafarers Yacht Club. Um, so the Seafarers Yacht Club is a 501c7 organization, which is a social club, and uh, the foundation is a 501c3 charitable organization. And that distinction is important to us, so it was important to have the partnership of the Yacht Club itself, as well as its philanthropic organization, the Seafarers Foundation. 
So both the boards of the Foundation and the Yacht Club approved our creation of the ship. Also in preparation for our founding, we partnered with U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla 2409 in Bowie Davidsonville. And this was actually before the national MOU between the Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Sea Scouts. So we had a formal vote um, by the flotilla to partner with us as we submitted the uh, founding paperwork for the ship. So those were our founding partnerships and have been um, a key component uh, of the success that our ship has um, achieved. But almost immediately after our founding of the ship, we formed three uh, additional partnerships, which were also critical to our ship's success. So the first was with the Annapolis Sail and Power Squadron, now called America's Boating Club, the Annapolis Maritime Museum, and the Chesapeake Bay Yacht Clubs Association. Each of these were important in its own way. So the Annapolis Sail and Power Squadron is almost a counterweight in some ways to the um, Coast Guard Auxiliary in terms of its vessel safety checks, uh, its training and education, as well as its uh, social events. And keep in mind, this has been during uh, COVID. And so the uh, Sail and Power Squadron had a very active uh, online presence. And so they invited to, us to many of their uh, online activities, both speakers, uh, courses, and even online social events. The Annapolis Maritime Museum is uh, right around the corner from the Seafarers Yacht Club uh, in Eastport. And uh, they have provided access for our Sea Scouts to their 75-foot skipjack, the Wilma Lee, um, as well as some of their education and training activities, such as uh, oyster dissection and uh, things of that nature. And then finally, the Chesapeake Bay Yacht Clubs Association, or CBYCA, has created uh, an agreement um, with Sea Scout ships that enable Sea Scout ships to be able to access or have reciprocity for um, their clubs uh, all up and down the Chesapeake Bay. There are about 120 of these CBYCA clubs. Uh, I happen to serve on the board uh, of CBYCA. And this was a, uh, an attempt to make the resources of the CBYCA clubs available to Sea Scout ships uh, on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, and there's a certain expectation for um, uh, behavior and so forth and the procedures for accessing the clubs, but this is a tremendous uh, resource. In addition to those core partnerships that we see as active and ongoing uh, partnerships, we were also um, blessed with many, many other opportunities for partnerships. And this plethora of opportunities has become, frankly, one of our greatest challenges. So if you look at these expanded partnership opportunities, and I, I put partnerships in quotes here because for most of these, it's been much harder to actually realize an ongoing partnership. We've done something with most of these organizations, but it's been harder to maintain. So the first one on the list is the Annapolis Public Library. So we, um, prior to COVID, had a very good um, uh, once a month community service project at the Eastport Annapolis Neck Public Library. And that was working very well. But as soon as the COVID restrictions uh, hit, they were not uh, set up to be able to do anything virtually. So that partnership has, um, I won't say dissolved necessarily, but certainly fizzled out uh, at the moment and has not yet been restarted. Uh, Faucets is a, a local chandlery here in Annapolis. Uh, really, really great selection of boat supplies and so forth. But they have a wonderful winter lecture series. And we thought this was great that we would be able to attend um, their uh, educational offerings to the community. So you see a picture here of us attending their diesel engine maintenance uh, lecture uh, at the, at the uh, store. And uh, in the picture that you see our, our past bosun, uh, Izzy, uh, giving out uh, one of our brochures to the speakers. And on the right-hand side, you see our current bosun, Caitlin, and several other of our Sea Scouts uh, sitting in the audience. So this worked uh, really well. Um, but uh, again, uh, with COVID, 
uh, this, um, they stopped these face-to-face -face, uh, lectures. They went to virtual um, and it was not as engaging for our uh, Sea Scouts and they didn't uh, stay, uh, didn't, didn't engage as much as we would have liked them to. And then when they moved to the hybrid, um, the hybrid uh, lecture just, the, the audio was not very good. And so that became a real challenge for us. So for each of these, um, we've had some success, like with the Maritime Career uh, Expo, that went really well, allowed us to recruit and meet um, several new uh, people. But with many, many of the other um, uh, potential partners, um, it just we've been had a difficult time maintaining so many uh, active partnerships, and it's something that I would really uh, like to work on, and I have some ideas around how to how to capitalize on that. So now let's talk just a little bit about some of our best practices, and then we'll talk about some of the lessons that we've learned. In terms of best practices, I think that um, we have done an exceptionally good job of maintaining active communication with all of our key partners. So the Seafarers Yacht Club, the Seafarers Foundation, and our key Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla uh, 2409, um, we've had a very, very strong active weekly, sometimes daily communication. So everybody knows what's going on, everybody's informed, everybody's actively uh, participating. Uh, we have a ship committee structure that uh, enhances that and it brings all of the key partners together. So everybody from all of the organizations that we actively uh, partner with are represented in um, our uh, ship committee uh, structure. We also have actively involved <clears throat> multiple Coast Guard Auxiliary leaders in the leadership of our ship. So the skipper's mate for program is the past commander of the flotilla, uh, 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 commander Bill Woodward. The uh, mate for administration is the current commander of the flotilla, uh, Captain Tanya Morris. And the treasurer for our ship is Captain Ed Morris, who's also an active member uh, of the flotilla. I will say we also have had um, one of our uh, Sea Scouts um, go through the formal process of applying to and being accepted into the flotilla as well and there are several others on the horizon. We've, we've been able to maintain uh, regular planning sessions, so we are very comfortable with using Zoom and other virtual organization practices. Um, we've also prioritized adult training. So um, in our uh, ship, we have had two wood badge trained uh, adult leaders. Um, we also have had four uh, sea badge trained adult leaders and one uh, staff member, uh, sea badge staffer. We also actively work to publicize our ship activities. Um, here in Annapolis, uh, the spin sheet and prop talk, uh, actually not just in Annapolis, up and down the Chesapeake Bay, these are two publications that uh, boaters rely on very heavily, and we've had some uh, very good coverage uh, in those two um, uh, magazines. They, they happen to be published right behind our clubhouse, so that makes it um, somewhat easy to be able to reach out to them. But um, uh, that's been, I think, a very good uh, practice that we've been able to have. Um, as I mentioned, the uh, Maritime uh, Expo uh, worked really well, um, but they've changed that structure and uh, it, it went away from the nice open um, Saturday uh, structure that they had at Annapolis High School to a much more complicated structure. And then again, with COVID, it went uh, online. But I think uh, that is a good practice for us uh, to be able to continue. And probably one of our best practices is that we spend a lot of time on the water. Uh, we think it's important um, to get the kids out, uh, whether it's sailing, kayaking, fishing. Um, uh, we do all kinds of uh, things on the water, and that's been important to us. In terms of lessons learned, we also feel like there have been some important um, experiences that we wanted to share. So one is recruiting. Um, so although our ship has grown, we actually haven't had an open house yet, which is the tried and true method for recruiting. And I believe that 
um, if we were able to um, start an active recruiting process through open houses, which we are planning to do in the fall, um, that would uh, really have an impact on the growth of our ship. Um, even though we put together flyers and brochures and we have a website, um, we really haven't recruited uh, amongst a variety of organizations, sailing schools, those kinds of things. And so we really want to focus on, on recruiting. And I think that if we don't get our recruiting um, structured better, um, we, it will have a negative impact on our ship uh, going forward. We also have run into some of the limits of youth leadership. Um, so we pride ourselves on being a youth-led ship, uh, really trying to have our youth uh, make decisions. We go through ILSS training, and each youth leader knows their responsibilities, what, what's in their portfolio. But, um, and I, I'm kind of drawing on our, our C-Badge training a little bit. Um, there have certainly been uh, instances where some of the expectations that we have for our youth leaders have not been met. Uh, one of those, frankly, is on our social media side and the website, um, where we've tried to have them build the website and to maintain the social media presence. And for some reason, it's just not happening. And, and so it looks like we're doing a lot less than we're actually doing. Um, I would also say that there's a, um, a lesson learned for us in terms of geographic proximity. Because we started um, our partnership with the Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla in Bowie, Davidsonville, for whatever reason, that has made it, um, we have not developed a partnership with the Annapolis Flotilla. And not only is it a little strange because the Annapolis flotilla is based here in Annapolis, but it's based on Fishing Creek, which is borders my own personal neighborhood. So the Coast Guard station in Annapolis is right on the same uh, creek that I share. And um, um, it, it's something that I, I, I feel like we should address in, in, in some way. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, have had a struggle um, managing all of the partnerships that we have. And I think that the lesson learned there is that we need to decentralize our partnerships a little bit more. Um, we do have 16 adults, and so all partnerships don't need to go through our mate for program or through the skipper, but we could um, probably try to manage those partnerships by distributing them and dispersing the responsibility for managing those partnerships a little bit broader throughout the adult and youth uh, in our ship. And that way we take better advantage of all the local opportunities that we have. And then finally, uh, one of our biggest challenges uh, has been managing donated vessels. Um, I guess partially because we do have a, a web presence, um, we do have a good deal of um, recognition uh, here in the Annapolis area. We have, um, um, be benefited from um, offers of donated vessels. Uh, we do have uh, our chartered organization is a 501c3 uh, Maryland charity, which allows the foundation to produce um, the uh, required documentation and paperwork for donated vessels. Um, we have seven vessels at the moment. Uh, we have turned down uh, a, a fairly large number of vessels that we've uh, had to say no to, but even with seven vessels, and that's um, four sloops uh, and one um, uh, twin engine powerboat, all of those have to be managed. So there's maintenance costs, there are um, berthing and storage uh, costs, um, and um, you know each of them requires a strategy for how do we manage um, those donated vessels. So that's some of the things that I want okay. All right, so let me stop sharing my screen and we're back to, okay.